music plays a big part in people's lives today. It has historically. Uh, and it's an important vehicle for popular expression, for popular communication, to exchange ideas, emotions, feelings. And if you look historically, right through to the present day, uh, it's social movements, it's movements for social justice, it's movements for peace, for democracy. Invariably, popular music has played a large role in communicating ideas through songs, popular songs, uh, just sort of unifying people, bringing people together. It has a very rich and important tradition uh, and legacy that still exists today. But even though music is the popular medium, it's the people's medium, it really isn't the people's medium in our society today. It's the property of four or five companies who have inordinate control over what sort of music gets produced and what sort of music doesn't, uh, and have made it much more difficult for it to be the people's medium. And this is the problem we face. This is the crisis we face. The whole idea of, uh, I had with about not signing with a record company was about um, not participating in a, in, a, in a corporate system, which I think homogenizes music, commercializes it, co-ops it, and, you know, basically uh, takes culture from people and sells it back to them, sucks, sucks the life out of it. So if you look at the music industry in the world in the United States today, this is what you find. There are five companies. They sell 80% of the music in the world. And four of these five are massive conglomerates, and the fifth one is no small fry in itself. Who are these guys? We'll start with the German company Bertelsmann, which owns RCA and Arista. It's the third largest media company in the world, or fourth largest, depending on how you figure it out. And their music interests, though, were all based in the United States. Then you've got Sony, the Japanese electronics powerhouse. Uh, then you go to the United States, you've got AOL, Time Warner. Then you've got uh, Vivendi, uh, based in France, which just bought uh, Seagram which before that had bought uh, MCA, which is another one of the big music companies. Then the fifth and final one, the small fry of the group, is EMI, uh, which only does, you know, seven or eight billion dollars a year in business. They were tried to cut a deal with Time Warner, didn't work, but they're on the market now. In all likelihood, EMI will be sold to one of the other companies. There used to be these, like, sort of, like, radio personalities who you at least wanted to believe were, like, choosing their own music and, like, playing stuff that they really loved. But now it's all pre-programmed. It's like, okay, you have to play the No Doubt single or the Bush single or the Limp Bizkit single every hour. And so it just doesn't feel creative or interesting. And you know there's no way that these DJs, you, all you have to do is listen to the sounds of their voices. And you know there's no way that they're going to like go into a record store and like look for something. They don't have any control over what's played. It's just like set out in front of them. It's all like pre-recorded. MTV's Total Request Live or TRL has become a carefully constructed marketing tool. Uh, you would think that kids were picking their favorite videos out of MTV's massive library, but that's not the case. It's pre-scripted, pre-groomed selections from MTV's regular to heavy rotation. And of course, to get on that regular rotation, you need the promotional money, you need the connections, and you need the tie-ins. But with TRL, you can really watch the machine at work. It's become a vital promotional stop for recording artists. But most importantly, TRL reaches teens and that is the key demographic for advertisers. Popular music is amazing because you think of the times when you're a kid and you think of, you hear a song and it flashes you back to when you were 12 years old and having a great time in the park and eating ice cream and you remember those songs. Like the real thing. No, no, ain't nothing like the real thing. That power has now been harnessed and is being used by corporations to do the same thing in attaching those songs to their products. So when you hear one of your favorite songs come on, instead of thinking about when you were 12 years old and having a fun time in the park, you're thinking of, God, I really want to go get a Big Mac or <laughs> something from Burger King, you know, or I would really like to be driving that car. And it's really, for me, it's been, it pisses me off because I've had a few of my favorite songs be ruined by the fact that I I don't have the association with them because they're using them on a burger commercial. Well, you know, the nature of monopoly is to perpetuate itself in its own image and not to innovate. And also, as, as these companies get bigger, there's more to lose. And that means that you need immediate results. You can't develop talent because talent can't be developed overnight. What you can develop overnight instead of talent is, for want of a better term, sensation. You know, so you get something that's kind of spectacular like Ricky Martin, 
but something with depth. You can't do that overnight. Cannot be done. These companies look to get bigger solely because they're run by business people and not creative people. They don't give a damn about the creative umbrella that's underneath it. <laughs> These are business people. So they feel personally no attachment to the art that's underneath them. Green is the bottom line to them, and by any means necessary, you know, they treat records and music um, as somebody would treat Brillo pads or, or Frito-Lay's chips. 